Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will act upon it and see the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. This morning, we began talking to you about the subject of clothing yourself with the garments of God. And we're going to continue on that, and we're especially looking at New Testament scriptures. But the subject more is going to be clothing yourself so you're not found naked. If you're found naked, you're in trouble. You must be clothed with the garments of God. We begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's our physical body, we have a building of God. Why? Because these guys have been building their spiritual house. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. This is a, a glorified body that everybody wants to get. But notice, we're desiring this. If so be, here's the condition, that being clothed we shall not be found naked. When we look at the word clothed here, this is talking about us doing what God has told us to do. Because it is a middle voice. Middle voice means we're doing it for ourselves. That's why Young says, if, if be, so be that having clothed ourselves, that's the way you would translate a middle participle, which is what this is, having clothed ourselves, then we would be able to see this come to pass. But if we haven't clothed ourselves and we are found naked, we'll be in trouble. We cannot be found naked, which is not having the spiritual clothes of God on in our life. And you will see many scriptures tonight, so several scriptures that show the importance of this. Now, we want to go back and touch on a couple things that we talked about this morning that are important. We are in the New Testament era, and in the New Testament era, a prophecy was given in Exodus chapter 10, 19, here in chapter 19, in verse uh, 5, first of all, that if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, all the earth is mine. And that they would be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. That was a prophecy for all of them. And then we come down to verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. We have to wash our clothes spiritually in order to be white as snow, to be those that are, have been clothing ourselves with the things of God and got rid of all the filth out of us. Now this day, today and tomorrow is two days. And we pointed out that that speaks of the church age, the two days, the 2,000 years of the church age. And when it says about washing their clothes, this is the word kabas, which means to perform the work of a fooler, not a fuller, but a fooler. And the fooler was one who would wash the clothes and get them as white as possible. No filth whatsoever. Absolutely white. And that's exactly what is we're to do. Notice, it says, let them wash as white as snow, like a fooler, their clothes. It's our responsibility to do this washing. That's what we do during the church age. Now we jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 23 and we see a picture of the Lord doing something, but this is also what he does here in the end time because he's coming to every Christian, he's coming to every church to see whether or not we're going to walk in the ways of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 23 in verse 14. The Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. The word walketh, this is a participle, which would mean it was a present tense type thing. Participles like the present tense, ongoing action. That's why Young's translates it, is walking. He's walking. In the midst of thy camp. So the camp is a type of the church. He's walking in the midst of the camp to see what the church is going to do. One of the things, of course, he comes to do is to deliver it. 
and to give up the enemies before thee, so we can conquer them and overcome them. And he says, therefore shall thy camp be holy. The church is to be holy. And then he goes on and says an important thing, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. Now the word unclean here is actually the word nakedness. As you see, as Young's brings it out, that he doesn't see in thee the nakedness of anything. Otherwise, you've been clothed. You're not unclothed, you're clothed. If you are unclothed, then that means you haven't done what's necessary to put on God's clothes, his garments. And notice, that means you wouldn't be holy because you wouldn't be walking in his ways. You'd be walking in ways of sin. And notice that if he sees any nakedness of anything in you because you haven't clothed yourself, he will turn away from you. He will not manifest himself to you. And this is, he's coming to every church to find out whether who's going to walk in line with the word, who is going to do what God commands, and who is going to be holy and who's not. We go over to Luke chapter 8, a scripture also that we looked at this morning, but important to see again. Luke chapter 8, we pick up over here in verse 27. This is when Jesus went forth. And there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time. He had a lot of demons that were in him for a long time. And notice it says he wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When it says he wear no clothes, this is a form, this word, and duo, but it's, it's a combination with another one, and the disco. And this particular word is an imperfect tense, meaning ongoing action in the past. He was wearing continually, and it's a middle voice verb, which means for himself. He was wearing for himself no clothes. That meant this guy did not clothe himself. And that's how he got all these demons in him. If you don't clothe yourself, you're going to be walking in sin. You're going to be walking contrary to the Word of God. And what's going to happen? You're going to get all these demons that are going to come into you from you because you're not protected. You're walking in sin. You're walking in the flesh instead of having God's clothes on, which is, comes because of the word in you that you're walking after. So this guy was in trouble. Now Jesus, of course, came to set him free and to cast the demons out. And then we come to verse 35 that we saw an important thing. They went to see what was done, came to Jesus. This guy was free from the demons. They got cast out. And they found the man of whom the devils that were departed. And it says, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. It's important that we look at what this is saying. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Sitting at the feet of Jesus is a present tense participle, meaning it was ongoing, continually sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what does the sitting at the feet of Jesus signify? As we mentioned this morning, but we'll mention it again. Who else was sitting at the feet of Jesus? Luke chapter 10, verse 39. Yet a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. If you are sitting at the feet of Jesus, you are sitting and hearing his word continually. That is important to see. Because if we are going to put on the garments of God and be clothed, we're going to have to get the Word in us. That's how it happens in your life. And you're going to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus continually hearing His Word. And what was the result of that? It said He was clothed. That doesn't mean He just decided to put on His clothes all of a sudden. It's not talking about that. The reason you know that, because when you look at this word clothed, it is a perfect tense verb. It's a spiritual revelation. And it's a passive voice, which means somebody else was doing this. So it's not talking about this guy suddenly decided to put on clothes, because he didn't do it anyway. It's passive voice. Somebody else was doing it. Who was doing it? God is doing it. How did it happen? Because he was in the Word, sitting at the feet of Jesus. But also, it's a perfect tense. The perfect tense is important when we see it, because... It is describing action completed in the past with ongoing effects such that the results are active and seen in the present. 
Otherwise, action completed the past with the present results at the point of time when it's speaking of this. So what this is saying is, not just the fact that he's put on his clothes at a moment here, no. This is a spiritual revelation that through the word of God that he was continually hearing, he was putting on the spiritual clothes of God in the past, and he kept them on and was walking in them, evidence because he, had, he was clothed at that point in time. And it also says he was in his right mind. That means you'll be in your right mind, not just because the demons are cast out, but it's because of the word coming into you. And you doing the word and seeing it work in your life, the present, the perfect tense, to the point where you are walking in it and you are following the way of the word of God. And he was in his right mind. And that's what God wants for us, to be in a right mind because we're going to walk in the ways of the word. Otherwise, the thing you need to see from this is just casting out the demons isn't going to bring the victory totally. Casting out the demons is part of it. But you've got to get in the word. You've got to get your spiritual clothes on. You've got to get clothed with the things of God. And you've got to be walking in it consistently so you don't give place to the enemy trying to come back in. And you've got to have your mind renewed to the word and be walking in that, taking your thoughts captive, thinking on good things, walking in the ways of the word, abiding, so to speak, in a right mind. And that's exactly what happened with this guy. <coughs> that's what God wants for us. Now, if we're going to do this, another scripture we looked at this morning, we looked at, need to look at for a moment, in Ephesians chapter 6. How are we going to get these spiritual clothes on so we're not naked? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word strong is the word en dunamo, which means power within. Dunamo comes from dunamis, which means power. En means in, power within. When he's speaking here to be empowered within, this is a commanding statement. It's imperative mood. It is a present tense verb, meaning this to be ongoing effect and action in your life. Otherwise, you're to continually be inwardly empowered, producing spiritual strength in your life. At the same time, it's a command to us, but we're not going to be ca causing this to come to pass because it's a passive voice. The passive voice means the subject is being acted upon by somebody else. So what that means is that you and I are commanded to be continually empowered to produce spiritual strength in us continually, but it's God who's going to do it. That's why it's the passive voice. And also in the power, this is a manifested power of his might or his mighty force. Well, if we're commanded to have this happen and it's God doing it, there must be something that we need to do. What is going to cause you to have power within and releasing power out with mighty force so you can conquer the devil? It's because you put on the whole armor of God. That is our part. And when it says put on, you've got to understand what this means. This is the word in duo, which means to like sink into clothing or to clothe oneself. You are going to have to clothe yourself to have the power of God in you and be able to manifest out of you with mighty force. This is also imperative mood, meaning it's a command to us. It's part of what we are, what's to be done. But this is our part to play because it's a middle voice. The middle voice means the subject is doing this for his own benefit and effect. Therefore, we are to clothe ourselves, is the way you would think of translating it, a command from God, our responsibility to do it, with the whole armor of God. And how do you do that? Through the word. We talked about it. The word in your heart, the word in your mind, the word in your mouth, the word directing your steps, the word that you're going to use to, 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 to defeat any attacks of the enemy, as well as smite the enemy and destroy the enemies in your life. It all involves the word of God in you. Now, in one other scripture that we looked at, passage, before we stop this, this morning, we want to look at again for a moment. We talked about many things in the morning message in the fact that there's many things we need to put off. We've got to put off all the filthiness. We saw them from Old Testament scriptures. We had to get rid of all the filthiness. We see in Romans chapter 13 and verse 12, The night's far spent, the day's at hand. Let us therefore cast off 
the works of darkness. You need to cast off, put off, get rid of the works of darkness. Anything that is not of the light, anything that's not in line with God's word, you need to get rid of it. And when it says this, it's a subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement. It's not automatic that it's going to get done unless you do it. Otherwise, it would really be better to say that, that we might cast off the works of darkness for our benefit, middle voice, we have to make sure we get rid of it because if you have filthiness and works of darkness, you are going to be unclothed. You're going to be giving place to the enemy in your life. And what, what are we supposed to do in place that we cast them off, but we need to also get something on at the same time? See, that's where you cast out the demons, but if you don't put something on, you're going to be in trouble because the devil will try to come back in. And if you don't have the word in you to resist the temptations, what's going to happen? He's going to come back with seven more wicked themselves, and the state of the man will be worse than the first. So when there's a putting off, there's also going to be a putting on. And that is, we're going to put on the armor of light. Again, this word, and duo. Again, this is middle voice. Subjunctive mood means it's conditional. It's not automatic. You have to do it to make sure that it gets done. That we might clothe ourselves with the armor of light, as it's talking about here with the middle voice. As you are doing that, we come to verse 14, and he talks about also another thing that we're putting on. As we're putting on this armor of light, another thing we're doing is we're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you're to become like him. Through the word of God and clothing yourself with the garments of God, you're actually putting the Lord on you. When it says put on, it's the same word in duo, like clothing yourself, again, and this time, when it says it, it's not giving a subjunctive mood. It switched to now an imperative mood. Before, it was saying conditional things. You should be you know, putting off these things, meet these conditions, and put on the armor of light. But now, he says, this is a command to you. Imperative mood. He's commanding you and me. Clothe yourselves for your benefit, middle voice, with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're commanded to do it. God expects every one of us to, to, commit, to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do you do it? Through the Word of God. And then he goes on and says, And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you walk in the flesh, are you putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? No, you're walking in sin and giving place to the devil, and demons are going to come into you by walking in the flesh, which is sin. When it says make not provision, that means forethought. You don't even have, give forethought at all for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You've got to stay on top of not yielding to the flesh. Remember, if we're coming after him, we're going to deny ourselves. We're going to take up our cross daily, crucifying the flesh. We put to death the deeds of the body so we don't give place to them in our life. And that is so important. So, we see again, we're to clothe ourselves. Clothe ourselves with the armor of light. That was a conditional statement to us. But we also have to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a command. Every one of us is to become like Jesus. That's what we would be the result, of course, of clothing yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, which comes from through the Word of God. Now we go over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we pick up here in verse 22. Remember, there is a putting off of the, that which is not of God and a putting on that which is of God. He says that you put off, same word that we've seen before, put off, put this thing away, get rid of it, eliminate it from out of your life for your benefit, middle voice again, concerning the former conversation. The word conversation actually is a word which means manner of life, conduct, behavior. Anything that is of the flesh, of the world, of the carnal way of living, that's the former manner of life, conduct, and behavior. You're to get rid of that. You're to put off. You are not going to walk at all according to the flesh, the way of the world, or the way of sin, or anything. Because remember, you're citizens of heaven now. You are to walk according to heaven's ways. And what he's talking about is the former behavior of what? The old man. 
which is that flesh, the way the old man would operate, and also a mind that's a carnal mind. It's not been renewed to the truth where you're just choosing to do what you want to do according to your desires or your thoughts. Notice, he said it's corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. It's corrupt. You can't walk according to the flesh or according to your thoughts and what you want to do. Remember, we're to live unto him. We don't live unto ourselves. We deny ourselves. And then he goes on and tells us something we're to do here. And to be renewed, actually, this is a infinitive, to be renewed, present tense, continually, it's an infinitive, but notice who's doing this. Passive voice. God's the one who's going to do this through the Word of God. And to be continually being renewed, and it says here, in the Spirit, this really isn't the best way to translate this. The reason is, because when it says this, here's the Word, We're down here, when I put the cursor over it, it happens to be the dative case. And Spirit is also in the dative case. So, and it doesn't, it's not, not talking, when it's something that's in the dative case, it is translated, it's like an indirect object, it's to something, the way you normally translate it. It would be better translated, and to be continually being renewed to the Spirit. Otherwise, to the way of the Spirit. Or you could say it in the Spirit, but you're not talking about, in the spiritual realm, it's talking about to the ways of the Spirit in the spirit, so you have a spiritual mind. Remember, we're getting rid of the fleshly ways, and now we're going to get the spiritual ways. And when it says, of your mind, this is talking about, actually, of your minds, because this is as plural here, actually, in the Greek. When you look at this, here is the word, when it talks about down here, and this is the word you, talking about the mind of you, and it is plural in the Greek. This is why it would be better at translating it of your minds, referring to all of the people. So this is talking about you getting your mind renewed to the Word of God in the Spirit or to the Spirit in the area of your mind. So you get a mind now, the mind of Christ. And that's essential. And what is going to happen when you get the mind of Christ? You're going to then, know, having the Word, the knowledge of God, you're going to be able to <coughs> put on the things that God wants which is to put on and clothe yourself with the new man. You're going to clothe yourself, how? Through the Word in you. The Word in you is the way that you accomplish all these things. And the mind renewed to the way of the Spirit is going to produce this being clothed. Again, this is the middle voice, clothing for yourself to be clothed with the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The new man is... Now, the man of Christ, the new mind being renewed to you, the mind of Christ coming into you, so that you think His way, and you'll walk in the ways of righteousness and holiness. So, you and I are to come to the place of getting renewed to the way of the Spirit, with a mind of Christ, it's supposed to be established in us, a spiritual mind, so to speak, and this is the way that you're going to clothe yourself with the new man, so you'll walk in the ways of righteousness and holiness. Then he goes on and he says, there's things to put away. We have to put away these things. Remember, if you don't put these things away, that means you're not going to be clothed with the things of God, which will be found naked. Wherefore, putting away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We should not be lying whatsoever. He says, be angry and sin not, let not the sun down go, go, go down upon your wrath. Now what is this talking about when it talks about being angry and sinning not? It's only when you have a righteous anger. Not one out of the flesh, not one you responding out of the way you feel. No, it would be a righteous anger because of something that is contrary to the word of God that is wrong. But it's going to be for a short time, not long, because you don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Anything that continues beyond, uh, says the sun going down, now becomes an area of sin. It's going to be short term. Neither give place to the devil. Of course, that's what you would be doing, giving place to the devil. Let him that ste stole steal no more. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands the things that is good. We aren't going to steal anymore. 
Let no corrupt communication, these are all things you put off in your life. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. God does not want you speaking wrong words, corrupt words. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the whole day of redemption. Meaning if you don't put off these things and you're walking in sin and you're doing these things, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. He also tells you more things to get rid of. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It's all got to go. We cannot be functioning with bitterness or anger or uh, wrath here uh, or an anger. This is an anger of of uh, an impulsive anger, violent type of raging attitude, clamor or evil speaking. It's all supposed to be put away from you. But remember, when we put things off, we're also got to put some things on and replace it, right? That's what the next verse says. You're to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. He wants you to be kind. He wants you to be tender-hearted. He wants you to be forgiving. You can't be holding unforgiveness against people whatsoever. Now we go over to Colossians' account. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, says this. Now you also put off, same word we've seen, all these. You're to put these things off. And here when he says this, again, this is the middle voice, but this time, it's not, it's not, a, it's not just a, uh, a definitive statement as it was in the past, it's an imperative mood, meaning it's a command. He's commanding you to put these things off. You are commanded to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. All these things should be put off. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. You put off all that. Then he comes on to verse 10 and he says, and you have put on, again, this is this word, clothing yourself, that's middle voice, for your own benefit, Put up, clothe yourself with the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. And when it says knowledge, this is precise, correct knowledge, accurate. So you've got to get yourself renewed to the exact, precise, correct knowledge of the Word of God after the image of Him that created Him. So you're, again, this is the same kind of thing. You're going to get your mind renewed, but it's got to be according to the Word, accurate, that's why you've got to be in the Word and doing what the Word says. Then we come to verse 12. Put on. Here he's again, in duo. These are things that you are responsible to put on, to clothe yourself with. And again, in Colossians, he keeps giving imperatives, commands. He's commanding you to do this, middle voice, for your own benefit. He commands you to clothe yourself as the elect or chosen of God. If you are really the chosen of God, you're going to respond to the call of God and you're going to do these things, obey the, the commands. Holy and beloved, you're going to put on bowels of mercies and compassion. You're going to show kindness. You're going to show humbleness of mind. You're going to show meekness and gentleness. You're going to be long-suffering. You're going to be forgiving one another. You're going to uh, forbearing one another. That means holding one another up, not tearing them down. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against thee, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Again, getting rid of all these things. These are commands. And then, of course, he tells you something you're going to put on. Above all these things, you put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. So you can go on into perfection. You must walk in love. It is mandatory if you're going to be able to go on to perfection in your life. We see something else about what we put on. These things are all the way you put on the Lord Jesus Christ through the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. Let us who are of the day, and we are of the day because we are of the light, be sober, putting on, and duo again. This means, again, for yourself, middle voice, putting on, clothing yourself with the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The three things that abide are faith, hope, and love. The breastplate, that covers your heart. Faith is of the heart, love is of the heart. Hope, that covers the mind, that speaks of your mind being renewed to the Word of God. So you're going to get faith and love in your heart. You're going to have hope, which is the anchor of your soul, which is your mind renewed to the truth of God's Word. 
So God wants you getting in, operating in faith. He wants you operating in hope. And He wants you operating in love at all times in your life. And then He goes on and says an interesting statement following that. For God has not appointed us to wrath. He doesn't want you to end up having wrath, which is a, be a judgment from God. But to the obtaining or the acquiring of obtaining or requiring, as Young's brings out, of salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That tells you something. As you're putting these things on, you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, what are you doing? You are moving towards acquiring and obtaining the salvation of the Lord. Remember that we are to put on the garments of salvation. The salvation of the Lord that will produce the salvation. And this means deliverance, means your preservation, safety. It refers to all these things. All these blessings, the benefits of being in Christ, all these things <clears throat> that he'll accomplish for you. Now, another thing. As you get the power of God resident in you, then power is going to be going out of you. In Mark chapter 5. This is not only important for you to be clothed so you're walking in the ways of the Lord, but also, look what it says over here in Mark chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue, this is the word dunamis, which means power, power had gone out of him. Why would power go out of him? Somebody was taking hold of it from him. Turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now, what's he talking about? Who touched my garment? Now, you can think of this in a natural sense, but this is not. It's really a spiritual revelation because all the people were touching his clothes when they came in contact with him. That's why, of course, you know, the disciples said, what are you saying, who touched me? Because the multitude's been thronging me, touching his clothes. We're not talking about in the natural. We're talking about in the realm of the spirit. And what was he doing? This person was touching his garment. And what garment was that? The garment that he had on, the garment that he'd put on, the garments of God that he'd put on in him. Power had been put on, just like you and I are to put on the, gar put on the garments of God, put armor of God that produces power within. This person was taking hold of the power of God that was resident in Jesus, and that brought healing. Because then, of course, he looked around to see who had done this thing. And it was the woman who had done this with her faith. She had taken hold of it. That's why he said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Her faith took hold of the power of God that was resident in Jesus. And that's, of course, she was made whole. He said, Go peace and be whole of thy plague. God wants you to get the power of God resident in you. And you are going to release it out to others. You also must understand that you are going to be taking hold of the power of God as you pray the Word of God, take hold of it from the Lord, from this power on the inside of you, from the Word, that's going to be your faith in the power of God to bring forth healing as well in your life. As you have the spiritual clothes on, the power of God will be resident in you, and it will be working through you. The Lord will be working, manifesting His power to bring healing in your life. It's also interesting over in Mark chapter 10, Verse 50, this is the guy who was blind, the blind man. And he, casting away, sounds like he's doing this at that point in time. No, it literally means having cast away. He already ca he cast away this garment. He said, I'm not, I'm, this isn't going to be my garment any longer. He rose and came to Jesus. Now, the garment was a natural garment that they had to wear to show that they were blind, but at the same time, was that going to get rid of his blindness? No. He was casting away this thing that was upon him, getting putting off that which was not of the Lord to come and to take hold of what was of the Lord. Jesus answered and said to him, What wilt thou that I might do? Might do because it is a subjunctive mood verb, that I might do unto thee. And the blind, said, blind man said, Lord. And it's interesting. This word Lord is not the normal word Lord, kurios. It's the word here, Raboni, which was a, a title of calling him Master and Lord and, and the Ruler. 
He addressed them, otherwise he recognized who Jesus was, who he really was. That I might receive my sight. He came with his faith to take hold of receiving his sight, being restored. And what happened, of course? Jesus said, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. It wasn't Jesus doing it. It said, his faith is what took hold of it, hath made thee whole. And immediately received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. As you get rid of things that are not of the Lord, he cast away this garment. Instead, he came to take hold of that from the Lord, and he received healing power to flow into him to bring forth a restoration that he might see again. And I think a key also is the fact that he recognized who he was. He is the Lord, the master, the, the one who is the, the ruler, the king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords of what he was going to become. He wasn't that yet, but he recognized that he was the Lord and the master and received from him. When you see Jesus as that, you acknowledge him as that and take hold of it, you can receive the miraculous power of God coming into you as well. We see also in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you subject one to another, be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. This is another thing we're to clothe ourselves with. You're going to clothe yourself with humility. And it's interesting, this is a little bit different type of a word, but again, it's referring, it's a command. We're to clothe ourselves with humility. God wants us to be humble. It means pride's got to go. You're not going to see... God bring forth what he purposes if you have pride. You've got to deny yourself and be humble before the Lord. God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. And then, as you are clothed with humility, also that you have to come to the place of seeing this humility be worked in your life. And that's what we see here, because it says, the King James says, humble yourselves. That sounds like that if that was the case, then this particular word would have to be an imperative mood and a middle voice, but it's not. It's an imperative mood, that's right, but it's a passive voice. So it wouldn't be humble yourselves. Instead, it is saying a command, be humbled. Be humbled by somebody else who is what? God. God is going to humble you, and how is he going to do it? under the mighty or powerful hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How does the powerful hand of God come to you? Through the word in you. As God's word is coming into you and the power of God's coming into you, he will humble you. You will, you will be submissive unto him. You'll be yielded unto him. You turn away from all pride. You put the word of God first place. It will bring you to the place of total submission and yieldedness to Him because you humble yourself under Him and you've been humbled by the mighty power of God, by God. And notice, this is a key for you to be exalted in life, that He may exalt you in due time. People don't get exalted as long as they're in pride, proud. You've got to be humbled. Humble yourself clothing yourself with humility, and be humbled by God, by the power of God working in your life. Then you can be in the position to be exalted. These are all things that we need to put on. So we put on the new man, we put on all these things, we put off all those evil things, the anger, the bitterness, the resentments, all these things got to go. But all of this is especially important of the clothing of yourselves if you're going to be right with the Lord. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 here, we come to verse 11. This is where it's teaching about the wedding, and the wedding was all prepared, all the guests were invited. They finally, and now they have the guests there. And in Matthew 22, 11, the king comes in to see the guests. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. You've got to look this up. When it says, had not on, it's really the word enduo, which we've seen many times before. And this particular one is interesting. It is a perfect tense and a middle voice. The middle voice, of course, meaning he was supposed to do this for himself, 
but the perfect tense means this is action that was supposed to be completed in the past with continuing effect at the time of when he's speaking to him. So what this is saying is that this guy had not done the work of putting on the wedding garment. He'd not done this in the past and having it in effect at that particular time. This is important because you have to have done that work in the past and have the wedding garment on, which is clean, it is white, it has gotten rid of all the filthiness, it's gotten rid of everything that is not of the Lord, and you are holy and righteous before God. He had not put this on. What happened to this guy? He said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in not having a wedding garment? How come you haven't done this work? He was speechless. He said to the king, the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This guy that came to the wedding, is he saved? No, he got cast out into outer darkness. Why? Because he didn't clothe himself in the past, have that work accomplished to bring him to the place of having the wedding garment on, clean, white, holy before the Lord. That means you and I must do that as well. And then the next verse is very interesting. For many are called, but few are chosen. Everybody's called. Everybody's called to come to this wedding. But in order to be accepted and to be chosen, you've got to have this wedding garment on. And the way you put the wedding garment on is you've got to clothe yourself with the garments of God, being holy, being righteous before the Lord. If you don't have the wedding garment on, you won't be chosen. You'll be one of the many who cast aside. Only the few are chosen, and those are the ones that have put the wedding garment on. Now that brings us to, well, we talked about this this morning, but we need to talk about it again. In Revelation, chapter 19, talking about this in verse 7. This is talking about the marriage of the Lamb. And the marriage of the Lamb is with Jesus and the church. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife, that would be the church, has made herself ready, ready and prepared. What did she do to make herself ready? To her was granted, or given, this really means given, that she might be arrayed, is really what this would be saying, because this is a subjunctive mood verb. Might be arrayed, middle voice, which means for herself. So the church, a believer in Christ, might be arrayed for himself. Otherwise, he's got to do this. It's his job to do this. It's conditional. This is what they're to have on to be for the wedding. In fine linen. Clean and white. And what's the fine linen? The fine linen is, it says, the righteousness of the saints, but that's not a good translation. We pointed out this this morning. It really is a word which means the righteous acts of the saints. Not a result, but the righteous acts of the saints. And we saw this. In fact, we pointed this out uh, this morning in uh, some of the ones Freiburg translates this righteous deeds. The Launida translate this as not acting justly or right or just action. Young's translates it righteous acts. And you look at any of the other translations, almost all of them, many of them have righteous deeds or righteous acts because that's what it's talking about. In other words, the, thought, there's, the, the, the church is to be given that they might be arrayed or clothed with these righteous acts of the saints, the holy ones. And what do the righteous acts, that means you're doing righteousness. What does doing righteousness produce? It produces you being clean and pure. And it produces you coming to the place of being white. Shining, brilliant, white as snow. And that's the ones that are there in the marriage. Meaning, <laughs> the ones that aren't like this, they're the ones that got cast out. Because these are the guys that have the wedding garment on. 
You must be white and clean and have the righteous acts as a saint, bringing forth the fine linen in your life, having put it on the wedding garment, completed action in the past with present results at that time. That's what God expects. We also see when Jesus is coming and he's starting to bring this judgment. It speaks here in Revelation 19, 14. The armies which were in heaven that were following him upon white horses. How, who, what were these people? These people were clothed and duo. And what does it say about these guys? They, middle voice, they have clothed themselves. Perfect tense. In the past, with it, the work had been completed in the past with the present results. So these are the ones that are make it to the, to the wedding. These are the ones that are going to be raptured. These are the ones that are going to be in heaven with the Lord. The ones who have, as it says, they have clothed themselves in the past with the present results in the righteous acts and righteous deeds of doing the word, producing them to be white and clean and pure and holy. That's who's going to be with them. And remember, many are called, but few are chosen. Who are the ones that are chosen? The ones that put on them are the wedding garment, that did get to this place. The ones that weren't chosen were the ones who did not do that. And they're the ones that are cast out. That's quite a statement. In fact, when you think about it, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These are when he's making, the, enemy, the nations are making war with the Lamb, and the Lamb overcomes them. He's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Notice who is with Jesus, and these are these armies that are coming with him. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Those are the only ones that are with him. Not just the called, that's the, the many, but only the few are chosen, so this is the few. And they're the ones that are faithful as well. Called, chosen, and faithful. That's what you must be. If you're going to be one of the few, you're going to be one of the ones that's going to be with the Lord. God wants you to have your garments white and clean. Remember that scripture that uh, we saw this one this morning, but we'll bring it up again. It's, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's in uh, Jude uh, 23. Yeah. Others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The word spotted actually means defiled. What defiles you? The flesh, because sin is it. So it means any of the works of the flesh, you're defiled. Your garment is going to be spotted. Are you, is your bo 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 uh, garment white and clean? No. It means you can't have the works of the flesh and think that you're going to be in this marriage with the Lord. Nobody's coming in that way. Only the righteous are going to get in there and the holy ones. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Hating. You, God wants you to come to the place of hating, detesting your garment. And this is talking about someone else, but anybody's garment spotted or defiled by the flesh. That means you can't have any fleshly works. Remember, we must crucify the flesh daily. We've got to put off and mortify the deeds of the body. Remember what happens. If you live after the flesh, you die. <laughs> uh, that's not going to be making it. That's not going to have eternal life whatsoever. Interesting statement in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the verse 8. Let thy garments be always white. They're always supposed to be white. God wants your garment white. I mean, it's not stained. It's not defiled, it's not polluted by sin or by the works of the flesh or you doing anything evil whatsoever. Your garments are to be white. And over in Revelation, when it talks about the judgment coming to the church, Revelation tells us some things that are pretty important. In verse chapter 3, we see beginning in verse 1. The angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. Or more literally, I have perceived in the past to know thy works. This is a word that really means to perceive, to bring knowledge to you. And it's perfect tense. It's the Lord saying, Hey, I perceive to, to know from all the things you've done in the past, 
your works. I, I see all these works. He's not talking about just at a point in time. He's talking about all the things you've done up to that time, see. I've known thy works, essentially. That's the way uh, Young's translates it. That thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. That's what you'd call a Christian in name only. Oh, they're claiming they have such a name, but they're dead. That meant they must not be living the life. He goes on and says, Be watchful, or become, more literally, become, ginnamai is the word, down here, become watching. You're to be watching, because the devil will try to come and to get you into sin, try to tempt you, get you to draw back from the things of the Lord, and walk, not do the works that God calls you to do. This is present tense, that's why it's be, become watching, as Young brings it out. And strengthen, make stable, make firm, set fast, this word means, the things which are remaining. Now remember, a whole lot of stuff obviously had died out because he was living, you know, he was, he was a Christian in name only. Be watching and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. They'd already seen a lot die. You know, when you see Christians that aren't walking right and they start going downhill, that means the things are dying out in their life. And if it's dying out in their life, they better get it turned around quick or they're going to be in trouble. Because notice what he says. He says, for I have not found thy works. Now, it says perfect here in the King James, but it's a poor translation because it doesn't mean that. It means filled up or fulfilled as Young's brings out below. It's not the word for perfection. It's the word to be filled up. Otherwise, I've not found your works filled up before God. Meaning our works are to be filled up. Filled up with working out our own salvation. Putting off all these things we should do. Putting on all these things that we're supposed to put on. Walking in the ways of the Lord. All the things that he says, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone that's not doing those things, they're going down and they're going to be in trouble. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard in the past, and hold fast and repent. Otherwise, get things turned around quickly. Repent. Get on board and start doing what's right. If therefore sh thou shalt not watch, if you won't watch, if you might not watch, again, subjunctive mood. If you don't get this turned around, you might st watch and stop the enemy from coming in and destroying you and bringing you down and everything's dying out in your life. I will come on thee as a thief. How, what's a, th a thief comes suddenly. That's what it means. I'm going to come suddenly on you. You think People think, oh, everything will be fine. No, it won't. All of a sudden, it's going to come suddenly on you, and you're going to give a judgment. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And then he says here, though, a positive thing. He says, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled... They haven't polluted and stained their garments. There was only a few. Remember the many? They're walking the wrong way. The many were all polluted. They were all defiled. They weren't doing what was right. He says there's a few that haven't defiled their garments. God won't remember now if we have defiled them, we've got to get rid of all that filthiness as we talked about. Get rid of it all. Put off all these things. And put on the things of God to produce what God wants in our life that will be holy, will be righteous, will be white, will be pure, will be clean before Him. And notice, these ones that haven't defiled their garments, is that they shall walk with me in white. Well, that's the ones that are right with the Lord. The ones that walk in white, remember, clean and white. Those are the ones that have the, the righteous acts of linen that are clean and white. They'll walk with me in white. Light, brilliant, for they are worthy. That shows you something. You've got to show yourself worthy before God, and it's going to be shown because you haven't defiled your garments. You've got this defiling out of your life, and you've come to the place of walking with Him in white. Only those who walk with Him in white are worthy before God. I mean, if you're walking in the flesh, you're walking in sin, you're walking in compromise, you're walking in the ways of the world, you're not going to be worthy. You're going to be in trouble. Because look at the next verse. He that conquers 
and carries off the victory, overcometh is nakao, which means to conquer and carry off the victory. And this doesn't mean you just did it once. Present tense, ongoing, continuous action. You continually are walking this way and you're conquering everything that comes at you. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. That tells you another thing. How do you get to the place of getting this white raiment? Not only through the word coming into you, you're doing what the word says and your works being fulfilled, but also through conquering the enemies, conquering and carrying off the victory. Are we able to conquer and carry off the victory? Absolutely. What's going to do it? Our faith. And we're supposed to have this faith and hope on us, put on us, remember. Though notice the same, the guy who's conquering and overcoming continually, that guy is clothed in white raiment. That tells you something. He has clothed himself. Middle voice. He has clothed himself, shall have clothed himself in white raiment. This is this white, brilliant garments. We've got to put on the garments of God. And he's in good shape. He'll be accepted in the, in the wedding. But what about the next guy? But the guy that doesn't do it, which is referring to the back here, really, the guys that were defiled. Because he says about this guy who's white, walking in white in the way of the Lord, he will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Well, what does that imply? The guy who's defiled his garments will be blotted out of the book of life. He's in trouble. But I always says, I'll confess his name before my father and his angels, talking about the guy who conquers. So in order for you to be clothed in white raiment, you have to conquer. Are you able to conquer? Absolutely. God has made you more than a conqueror. He has put you in a position of authority. You can conquer all sin. Sin has no dominion over you. You can conquer everything. You've got authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can conquer sin and, and every work of the enemy. God wants us to understand you're to be conquering. You can't sit on the sidelines. You need to engage in the warfare and conquer everything that comes against you in order to be clothed with the white raiment. And again, you're, what you, might, you might have your garments on, but then you could sit there and give place to the enemy and and see destructive things come in. Look at this principle shown here in James 5, 2. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. They've been eaten up. But what's a moth do? It causes holes in it all over the place. It's getting destroyed. Well, that's what can happen to people if we don't walk in the ways of the Word. If we don't walk in the ways of you can lose anything you've gained, remember. Just because you have arrived at some point doesn't mean that uh, you're, you know, it's, it's going to be ongoing. Notice what he says. The word are is actually the word ginemai, become. Your garments have become moth-eaten. Well, why was that? Perfect tense, meaning it was an ongoing work in the past that resulted in now your garments are all moth-eaten. It just didn't happen just suddenly. Remember, whenever you see the perfect tense, it's talking about action completed in the past with the effects at this point. This is a guy who's letting the devil have place and the devil's coming in and he's walking in sin and his garments are getting destroyed. You cannot let your garments that you put on in your life get destroyed. You've got to guard yourself and be watching and keep your garments and not let the enemy have place. This brings us to another place in Revelation that we need to look at. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. And this is the church Laodicea. Here, he speaks to this church, and he says in verse 15, I know, or I have known, same thing, your works. I've known all your works that have brought you to this place where you're at now. Because again, this is the word ido, which means to perceive to bring you to the place of knowing. And it's a perfect tense verb as well. I mean, I have known all these things, all your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were either cold or hot. Otherwise, what happened to this guy? 
So then, because thou art lukewarm, in other words, they let some bad stuff in, because what's lukewarm? Lukewarm is a combination of cold and hot. You want to be hot. If you got some cold coming in, it's made you lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. That means I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. <laughs> and we don't want to be vomited out of our mouth whatsoever. In fact, what this really, really literally says, it says not the, the will is a word mellow, which means here, as we see this, it means that I am about to, or in this sense, intending to, having in mind, thinking to vomit you out of my mouth, if they wouldn't repent. Remember at the end of this, he calls them to repentance. If they'll repent, then everything will be fine. But if they don't repent, this is what's going to happen to them. They're going to get vomited out of his mouth. And then he comes and he says, because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing, Knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Meaning, these guys, they weren't clothed. They were unclad. They didn't have the clothing of God on. And he, so this, these guys are in trouble. What do we mean when we see these five things that we see here? When it talks about the guy who's wretched, it's talking about someone who's living under the body of death in the flesh. They're basically living according to the flesh. The reason we say this, this word is only used two times, as you see down here. This is one of them. The other use reveals, really, what this is talking about, the state of the person. It's over in Romans chapter 7, in verse 24. This is where Paul was saying, in this context, the things that I want to do, I'm not doing. The things that I am doing, you know, I don't want to do, and things I'm, you know, you doing the things he didn't want to do and not doing the things he did want to do. So he says, here's the state he comes to. He says, oh, wretched man, that's the word. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Meaning that someone who is wretched is living under the body of death. He's living in the flesh. He's not living according to the way of the Spirit, and he is in trouble. Then when it talks about the next one being miserable, We'll go back to that for a moment. Revelation 3, verse uh, 17, miserable. This is also a word that is used two times only. This is one of the uses. And the other use is over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, that gives you an idea of what it means to be miserable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are, of all men, most miserable. Same word. Meaning, why is this guy miserable? Because his focus is only on this life, this uh, life that only in, in the, uh, that's going on now in our own physical life. Otherwise, if we only had just this life now, we didn't have any uh, uh, eternal life in the future, we'd be miserable. That's what they were. They only had their life focused upon that which was now. Otherwise, they're living for the present, not living for the future, not living for what God wants, not working, certainly working out their own salvation. They're just living, doing their, their hope is totally in the natural life only, and they're not living for the Lord, obviously. Another we see is the person says that he's poor. Well, what's that mean? If he's poor, that means he's lacking spiritually. He's lacking the riches of Christ. And that we've covered a message on that in the past. The riches of Christ are all kinds of things. Possessing his, his knowledge and understanding and wisdom and, and possessing fruit and all the different things that he brings forth in your life. And he's also, he's blind, meaning he can't see. Spiritually, he can't see now. Spiritually blind. He's not able to see. He's not perceiving things. He's just running around in the natural. And he's also naked, meaning he's spiritually unclothed. Spiritually unclothed. And you're in trouble if you're spiritually unclothed, remember. And then we come down to verse 18. So what's he tell him to do? This is the answer. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Well, what has been tried in the fire? The word of God is that which has been tried 
get the word. And, and when it talks about buying, because the, re the reason it says this is because it's going to cost you something to get the word of God. And it's even interesting that this statement about buying the word is even shown back in Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth, sell it not. Also wisdom, instruction, understanding. You're supposed to, and the word buy is referring to acquiring it. Get this, possess it. That's what it's talking about. So you're supposed to buy the word, essentially, possess it, acquire it, get it. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to spend time getting in the Word of God because what's the problem with this guy who's lukewarm? He's not in the Word. He's living basically in the natural. He's living in the flesh. He's got his focus on all these things. I have my riches. I got my uh, goods. Uh, everything seems fine with me in my life. Everything's going good. He's not living for the Lord whatsoever. He's in trouble. So, we not, and then he goes on and says, what's going to result? That thou mayest be rich. With what riches? The riches of God, not the riches of the natural. The riches of Christ is what you want. And what else will you get? And also he says that you're also to buy this white raiment. Remember, we get the white raiment by conquering the enemy and by getting the garments of God put on us, the word of God, and becoming white and clean and pure and, and walking in the way of righteousness. White raiment. This is this bright, brilliant raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Meaning if you don't have the white raiment, you're not clothed. You're naked. Oh, we can't have that. We've got to get this. And the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. Meaning that if you're naked, you're, in, you're ashamed. You're dishonored. You're disgraced to God. God doesn't want us to be dishonored or disgraced to Him whatsoever. But if we're naked because... Spiritually talking about, we have not the garments of God on. We are going to be shamed or we're going to be disgraced before Him. And also he says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Otherwise, when you get the word in you, the Holy Spirit's going to bring revelation. He's going to open your eyes so you'll be able to see. Remember, they were blind. They couldn't see anything. Why? Because they weren't walking in the way of the Lord. And you're going to, that you might be able to see and be able to walk in the ways of the Spirit. Otherwise, they're not seeing things in the Spirit. They're just walking around in the natural. As many as I love, I rebuke. God will come to rebuke and to chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Anybody who is not hot for God, they need to be rebuked and chastened. God tells us, be zealous and repent. That means... You need to burn with zeal. You just don't just you continue this way. You better get in order and get things in order quickly with a, with a zealous attitude. Be zealous and repent. It means change your mind. Remember, repentance is shown by fruit. How do you know you have repentance? By the fruit in your life, by the works, by the, the you show repentance by the change in action. Not just because I say I repent. People say they repent all the time. And then you look at their life, are there any fruit? Is there any change? Is there any works of showing that forth? No, not at all. We must come to that place. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That shows you that this guy, because he's walking in the flesh, the Lord's not even manifesting it. He's on the outside. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Meaning, if you'll hear my voice, if you might hear my voice, meaning this person hasn't been hearing the voice of the Lord. This is a subjunctive mood. That means it's conditional. If you'll hear my word, which is his voice, open the door, I'll come in to him. And certainly he's knocking, when he stands at the door, so I'm out the door of your heart. You've got to give your heart to the Lord. And people that don't give their heart to the Lord, they walk in the flesh. They just walk after the world. They just walk after whatever they want. They don't live under the Lord. You can't be that way. This is obviously someone who has not put on the garments of God. They do not have the white raiment on. Their eyes are blind. They're miserable. They're wretched. They're living after the flesh. And they're, they can't see spiritually and they've been deceived. And then he goes on and says, Him that overcometh, conquers, and carries off the victory. 
And remember, that's what's necessary to get this white raiment. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne? That's quite a statement. Jesus had to overcome for him to be able to be with the Father in his throne. What do you think about us? Well, that was just Jesus. Well, it's not going to be any different. We have to do the same thing. The disciple is not above the master, you know. We're going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to overcome to be able to sit with him in his throne as well. Mandatory. Therefore, we've got to get the garments of God put on in our life. In fact, look at the picture in heaven of the ones that are up there in Revelation. Revelation 7.13, One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? Arrayed. This is the white, brilliant light. And these ones were arrayed in these white robes. There must be another. Here it is. They're clothed in the white robes. Notice this. The perfect tense. That meant the action was completed in the past for them to get this white robes. And because of God's work in their life, passive, he's the one that does this, and they've come to that place. Meaning, if you do this work, then you will have the white robes. That's who's up there in heaven. Yeah, the ones that aren't having that, they're not going to be there. Whence come he said, He said unto them, Sir, thou knowest, he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes. They washed clean and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These guys got whitened. The blood of the Lamb cleanses you from all the sin. You get turned away from your walking. If you're walking the light, then the blood's going to be applied towards you. These guys have washed and become white. Otherwise, these are the guys that are up in heaven. The people that aren't doing that, they're not going to make it. Revelation 16, verse 15, look what it says here. Behold, I come as a thief, suddenly. Blessed is he that is watching, as Young's brings out, and is keeping, he's keeping or guarding his garments. That means anything that you put on in your life, you better be sure you keep it on and you guard it and you don't let it be taken out. Remember, the devil will try to take things away, to take the word out. The word in you is what produces these garments in your life, remember lest he walk, or might be walking, may, wa may walk, subjunctive mood, might be walking, present tense, naked. You can't be walking naked and think you're not going to get anywhere with the Lord. You're going to get smitten by the enemy, and you're going to be defiled and spotted, and you're not going to be white or pure or clean whatsoever. And they see a shame. Otherwise, you've got to be watching and guarding and keeping your garments. Here's another picture of these guys that are up in heaven. They all have seen this work done. Here's the throne, throne 20 and four, 20, uh, 4 and 20 seats upon the seats were 4 and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. These guys were clothed in white raiment too because they had the work completed in the past, perfect tense, by the Lord, passive, with the present effects. These guys all had done what was necessary. That's how they got to this place. Clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Crown is the Stephanos crown, which is that which is the prize to the victor. Otherwise, they'd conquered and carried off the victory. Remember, those are the ones that get the white raiment. That's what you've got to be. These guys are all, all the guys in heaven are the ones who've conquered and carried off the victory. You and I must conquer and carry off the victory if you're going to get to heaven. Well, I thought I could just sign on the dotted line and everything would be fine. It didn't matter. That's the deceiving line teaching that the devil has brought to the body of Christ and deceived the multitudes. Remember, the ones that were defiled, they were getting their names blotted out by the, the book of life. Only the ones that were not defiled were the ones, and the ones that had conquered had the white raiment, and their names were confessed before the Father and before the angels, remember. This brings us back to where we began on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
We come to verse that three again. If so be, if so be that being clothed, that means we got to be clothed. Remember what this is. Middle voice, having clothed yourself, you did this work. We shall not be found naked. If you're found naked, are you going to be with the Lord? Are you going to be accepted by Him? No way. Remember, the one who gets found naked, he, gets turned, he turns away from them. No, we're not gonna, you're not going to be with me whatsoever. Remember the guys that are walking in lawlessness? Depart from me. The guy that's walking in unrighteousness and Luke, I don't know you from where you're from. Who are you? He didn't because he knows you as what you're walking after continually at any point in time. And then he goes on and says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Because what are we wanting to get? A glorified body. But to be able to get the glorified body you have to first have clothed yourself with the white raiment and be holy and the righteous acts, remember, the linen and not found naked. The ones that are, not, that are found naked, they are going to be cast aside. This is absolutely essential. You and I must come to the place, as we said, of clothing ourselves so we're not found naked because if we're found naked, we're in trouble. Those guys that were naked, they were, you know, they were going to be vomited out of his mouth. You know, They were naked. They weren't clothed. They were miserable. They were living after the flesh. They were living away, doing whatever they wanted. They thought, well, I have my riches. I have all my, my goods, and I have needed nothing. You know, I don't need anything. They were deceived totally by the enemy. So as we've looked at this this morning and tonight, we can see that it's mandatory for you to clothe yourself with the garments of God. At the same time, put away all the iniquity, all the filth, all the evil, anything that defiles you. Get rid of it all out of your life. And you put on the things of God. So we get rid of all the evil. and we put, It's not just getting rid of the evil and not putting things on. See, this is again where people say, oh, I'll just cast out the demons and everything will be fine. But they don't put on the things of God. That's a mistake. And why do they end up getting worse? Or why do they really never get anywhere? Because they haven't done the whole package putting on the things of God. You've got to put on the garments of God to come to the place of being ready for the marriage, which is the righteous acts, coming clean, coming white, being pure, being holy, being righteous before the Lord. That's putting on the new man. And put off all of the old evil things in your life. They all got to be eliminated. So therefore, you and I must clothe ourselves so we're not found naked. If we're found naked, that's just like you know, the coming to inspect us and say, hey, how, how come you're naked here? Just like he inspected the guy, the king came to the wedding guest and says, where's this wedding garment? You don't have the wedding garment on. And he cast them out into outer darkness. Make sure you are putting on the garments of God, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, putting on all the things it says, all the good things, you know, putting on love and you're putting on faith and you're putting on hope. All this is the word in you that you're hearing and doing and you're walking in line with it. And you put off all the things that are evil. Anger. You got a problem with anger? Get rid of that thing. Start casting it out. Put that thing off. Get yourself filled up with the kindness, the mercies, the compassion, the love of God, all those different things through the Word in you. And it's the Word in you is going to do this work. God will do this work, and He will bring you to that place. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank You and praise You for the Word of God that shows that it is mandatory that I clothe myself with the garments of God. I must clothe myself so I'm not found naked. If I have not clothed myself, I will be spiritually naked. I thank you that I will not allow my garment to be defiled or to be spotted by the flesh, by the world, by any ways of sin. I am putting off everything that is not of the Lord and I am putting on 
that which is of righteousness and holiness through the Word of God. I see it's my responsibility to put this on and God accomplishes the work that I will have white raiment. I will be holy. I will be righteous. I will be ready for the marriage of the Lamb. I thank you that I understand it's conditional. I am to be arrayed with the fine linen, clean and white, but it's dependent upon me doing what the Word says. So I'm going to put on the wedding garment, walking in righteousness, being cleansed, producing holiness, walking before the Lord in line with the Word. And I am putting on the Lord Jesus Christ because I'm becoming like Jesus. I am becoming like Him because I walk in the Word in everything that I do. And that is evidence that I have put on the garments of God. I thank you, Lord. I will be a doer of this word, and I will have the Lord Jesus Christ in me and upon me because I put on the garments of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So important. I mean, this is, this is, this is determining where you're going to be eternity-wise. And we see from Matthew 12, uh, 22 and Revelation chapter 3 and also Rev, uh, both of those places there. It's very important. Otherwise, we just can't be just doing whatever we want. We've got to put off and put on. Get these things established in your life. Clothe yourself with the things of God. God will do the work. You just hear the word. It all comes down to the word and you've done it. Hearing and doing the word and putting off all the things that are not of him. Father, we thank you for accomplishing this great work in us that the garments of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous linen garments, the being pure, clean, holy, white as snow, white like a fooler, is going to be accomplished in our life through the word of God. And we will put off everything that is not of you. And we will put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for much fruit as we hear and do this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.